I must say that being in sin is like being kidnapped. Sometimes a ransom can be paid to the culprit to free the hostage. Shalom, welcome to Crosstalk. I'm Josh Weiss, and this is part two of a series called God Forgive Me? It's all based on this book written by my father, Dr. Randy Weiss. The whole series discusses what it takes for God to forgive us of our sins, and it analyzes what things looked like for the Old Testament Jews. We left off in the last episode with Dad setting the stage. To put it briefly, he was showing how it only takes one sin to make you a sinner. And the only way to fix that is some sort of atonement. Let's jump right in. As someone who was a very bad person, but judged myself as being good enough, I must say that being in sin is like being kidnapped. Sometimes a ransom can be paid to the culprit to free the hostage. And that is how God desires to free us. He will pay the ransom to buy us back from captivity to sin. Now, sometimes hostage situations end differently. Later in this discussion, I will talk about such a hostage situation and a local rabbi in our small town. For now, I must clarify that the intended audience for this discussion is primarily for non-Jewish Christian readers. This is because many people will be introduced to this work as a result of my involvement in Christian media. Nonetheless, some might choose to share this discussion with Jewish friends who have differing viewpoints. I hope my detractors will identify this as a viable academic argument from another side of Judaism. If we cannot convince, I trust we can disagree respectfully. I face a rather unique dilemma. Being a Jewish TV preacher, some might question my purposes, my approach, or my credibility. Perhaps some may question my research or doubt the veracity of my claims. Good. Responsible people of faith owe it to themselves to maintain a healthy level of doubt as they approach the words of frail men. Even men of deep convictions make mistakes. And since this conversation focuses on predominantly Jewish issues, I anticipate that some readers will seek the advice of their Jewish friends, Jewish associates, or their Jewish religious leaders to confirm the accuracy of my conclusions and the quality of my research. I will provide copious documentation, plenty of footnotes for facts and quotations that intellectual and academic honesty require. They're all in the printed version of this book or in the online PDF that you're welcome to download for free. More important, I want any Jewish readers who doubt my conclusions to feel free to check my sources. For the most part, I've chosen thoroughly Jewish sources for my research. I felt this mandatory to offer a kosher product for your consumption. At the core, this is intended to be a didactic device, a teaching tool. Please do not expect more. I will simply convey information and perspectives with which you may be unfamiliar. The goal is to offer new information for your evaluation. I will share my conclusions and assume that each reader is wise enough to draw their own. Those who hear me will be presented with various facts, opinions, and reflections about a biblical view of atonement and sacrifice. And I hope this work will cause readers to reach their own better informed beliefs, regardless of their theological perspectives. A chasm exists between Jews and Christians. The church, oh, the church has a dangerous lack of knowledge about its own Jewish origins. One result of that has been that some Christians have burned bridges instead of building them. May God help us build bridges instead of burning them. I hope this Jewish-oriented research will be beneficial to non-Jews who seek a better understanding of my people. Now, I, I have a smorgasbord of degrees, diplomas, and certificates. Nonetheless, I continue to wrestle with many questions about history, faith, religion, and the Bible. 
As I researched to prepare this discussion, I chose to remain open to the new information I learned as I studied. I hope my readers will do the same. Over the decades, some Jewish religious leaders and even some family members have tried to deny my Jewishness. They were wrong. My heritage is simply not something they can control or alter. My family, my faith, and my Jewishness will not be defined by others. They're mine. So as to get any philosophical or political baggage out of the way, I will explain myself and declare my views so nobody need guess at what the speaker, the author of this book, I don't want you to have to wonder what makes me tick. So I will ask you to consider a simple Facebook post that I wrote to make it easy for Facebook friends and Facebook trolls to know what to expect from me. No hidden agenda. Yes, I have an agenda, but I'm open about it. It seems I'm forced to repost this every now and again, particularly when a national election rolls around. So buckle up and let me get this out of the way. By the way, if you don't like this, I'll apologize, but I don't care. In case anyone is new to my Facebook page, and I hope you will become my Facebook friend if you're not already, but I don't want you to be shocked at what you see, so I'm going to just be up front and declare what I have posted on my page. In case anyone is new to my Facebook page, let me be clear. I am pro-life, pro-Israel, pro-Christian, pro-American, and opposed to anything that would diminish the influence of normative biblical faith in our society. There's no need for my Facebook friends to agree with me. Other views are welcome, but don't be offended or surprised if my comments presume biblical norms to be the basis for a well-adjusted, fruitful life. We can be friends even if you reject the Bible or its author. It would be appreciated if mutual respect is shown. So in the immortal words of a great amphibian artist, moving right along in search of good times and good news with good friends you can't lose, so said Kermit the Frog. Judaism is the womb of the church, the keeper of God's words and His festivals. With my soapbox conveniently stacked, adjacent to my unashamedly unwrapped agenda, allow me to pose two fundamental questions for readers and listeners in my Christian audience. Why should Christians be interested in Jews or Judaism? More to the point, since they seem peripheral at best, why should Christians be interested in the Jewish Bible's perspective of atonement or in the related Jewish festivals? A quick list of reasons will provide answers as to why Christians should keep listening if the bullet points I will express were not already completely obvious. True Christians realize that the God of Israel chose a humble Jewish virgin to bear his child. Therefore, Jesus, the Son of God, was born to a Jewish mother. Joseph, his adoptive father, was Jewish. The disciples were Jewish. They lived in a Jewish land. They reverenced and believed in the Tanakh, the Jewish Bible. The Tanakh is an acronym for the Torah, the five books of Moses, the Nevi'im, the prophets, and the Ketuvim, the wisdom writers. They spoke, wrote, read, and understood Jewish languages and Jewish idioms. They attended Jewish worship services in Jewish temples and in various Jewish synagogues. For several centuries, the New Testament church did not have a New Testament. Most scholars concede that the New Testament is largely based on the writings, history, and wisdom of the Old Testament, the Tanakh. And as I like to tell folks, if you remove the direct quotations, references, or paraphrase sections of the Hebrew Bible from the New Testament, you could write it on a dinner napkin. Now, perhaps that is a slight exaggeration, yet any responsible representation of the New Testament clearly shows 
that it is predominantly dependent on the ancient Jewish writings for its primary sources. And other portions were based upon Jewish, apocryphal, or Jewish pseudepigraphical writings. These are non-canonical yet invaluable texts such as the Assumption of Moses and the books of the Maccabees and the book of Enoch. And finally, the so-called Jewish festivals that I've referenced are actually biblical festivals. They are not necessarily to be limited to the Jewish people. All people who reverence the Bible should be interested in the festivals ordained by the God of the Bible. Most of the Bible from Genesis 12:1 through Revelation was written by Jews to Jews, for Jews, about Jews, or with Jews in mind. Now Luke and Acts were probably written by a Gentile, but nonetheless, both books address Jewish issues on behalf of the early Jewish church. And Luke was a physician. Any Jewish mother would have been proud to have bragged to her friends about her son, the doctor. So to correctly understand our New Testament, it is beneficial to have a working knowledge of the world from which it was birthed. Judaism was the womb of the church. Christianity developed in a very Jewish world. In fact, it was so Jewish that some of the founding fathers of the faith were astonished that God made room for the Gentiles. God sent three supernatural signs before Peter was convinced that it was religiously safe to visit Cornelius, a Gentile, a Goy. Remember, even the original evangelists who worked outside of Israel were said to be initially preaching to none but the Jews only. By the way, when we really begin digging into Judaism, Christianity, and the requirements for remaining in one category or another, things can get a bit confusing. It's important to figure out what you are. And this reminds me of a humorous story told by the legendary Christian comedian, Jerry Clower. You see, we all need to figure out our identity in this confusing age. And it is helpful for those around us to know in which category we see ourselves. The late Mr. Clower recounted a country tale that makes this clear. On the ranch, Three bulls were in the paddock discussing events and things of the day. Suddenly, they overheard the rancher tell the hired hand, that new bull will be here any minute. I look forward to introducing the new bloodline to our herd. Well, the three bulls discussed this. The old bull said, fellas, as you know, I've been here several years. I have 200 girlfriends and I am not giving up even one to this new bull. If it's a fight he wants, he will get it. The second bull said, same for me. I've been here quite a while. I have 100 girlfriends and I'll not give up any either. The third bull said, well, I'm pretty new here. I only have 50 girlfriends, but I'm not giving up any of mine to that carpet bagging new bull. About that time, a big cattle hauling trailer pulled up and dropped the gate. The door was carefully opened up, and there he was a 2,700 pound Brahma bull, all muscle and bluster. He was bellowing, making deep, terrifying sounds, blowing snot out of both nostrils, slinging his head. It was just a sight. He looked absolutely terrifying. Rocking the whole trailer, he furiously made his way down the gangplank to scope out his new home. The first bull said, uh, uh, fellas, uh, on second thought, that was, that was mighty greedy of me, thinking only of myself that way. I, I, I believe I will rethink this matter. Uh, maybe, maybe I will go ahead and let them have, oh, say, 50 of my girlfriends. No need of being so selfish. The second bull said, 
you know, I think you're right. I, I, I think I'll give him 25 of my cows, too. I, I do not know what came over me being so selfish-minded. The third, third young little bull let out a challenging roar. He slung his head back at forth and began bellowing and blowing snot. And then without warning, the little bull took off running toward the trailer wide open. The older bull said, oh, oh, he's lost his mind. He will surely be killed. We got to stop him before he gets crushed. And they took, they took off after him, catching up and said, little, 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 little fella, little fella, what, 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 what is it you're doing? Don't you know that thing will kill you? You can't whip him. He's twice your size. Those 50 cows are not worth dying over. The young bull said, he can have the 50 cows. I just want to make sure he knows I'm a bull too. Categories matter. Find yours. And be it as fearlessly as that young bull. You never know who's watching. Rosh Hashanah, the launch of the Jewish days of awe, or days on a calendar to enter into any discussion about a view toward atonement, from a Jewish perspective, one must address the reverential Jewish high holy days. Within our modern Jewish tradition, Rosh Hashanah begins the Jewish days of awe, Yomim Noraim. The term Rosh means head, and Hashanah means the year. It is literally the head of the year. This blessed celebration occurs at the beginning of the Jewish month of Tishrei. It's the seventh month on the Jewish calendar, and it generally falls in September. Now, our New Year's Eve is not celebrated as other cultures with partying and revelry. Many Jews believe that the Book of Life is opened on Rosh Hashanah, and it is then that God begins going over his checklist in many ways Rosh Hashanah has been celebrated with little change since the first century of the Common Era following the Roman destruction of the Temple in 70 of the Common Era. So I have a question. Do these traditional practices mirror more ancient original practices of Temple Judaism? The answer is a resounding no. Another question. What is the primary distinction how are modern practices of Rosh Hashanah different from ancient practices of this celebration? The answer is sacrifice. Many people fail to realize that in biblical times, prior to the destruction of the temple, Rosh Hashanah was quite different. Biblical Judaism viewed Rosh Hashanah through an entirely different lens. In fact, throughout the entire Bible, there is no reference to that day as Rosh Hashanah. The prophet Ezekiel mentions the name Rosh Hashanah, referring to the 10th day, not the first, of the Hebrew month of Tishrei. Another term used to describe this celebration is Yom Hazikaron, the day of remembering. Perhaps the most accurate biblical name for the holiday is the one which describes the event. It is the day of sounding the shofar, Yom Teruah. Considering the importance placed upon the holiday by modern Jews, I find it very interesting that the Bible is comparatively silent about this festival. The basic reference to the holiday is found in Leviticus chapter 23, verse 24. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, saying, In the seventh month, in the first day of the month, shall be a solemn rest unto you, a memorial proclaimed with the blast of horns, a holy convocation. Ye shall do no manner of servile work, and ye shall bring an offering made by fire unto the Lord. For a point of reference about synagogue attendance and funding the services of religion, Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur are like the Christmas and Easter traffic jams of the faith. Both faiths celebrate two rock festivals of 
religious attendance. And those are the two gatherings when failing to pass the plate could sink the economic ships of faith. Well, Jews don't take up offerings or promote tithing. Instead, we sell tickets to reserve our seats for the High Holy Days, and we pay for synagogue membership. But both religions have very similar challenges. It is not uncommon for many Jews and Christians to visit God's house for special religious festivals twice a year. Some succeed in scratching their spiritual itch and checking the box that validates the religion to which they belong by not missing those two special occasions. They may even consider it a worthwhile sacrifice, but God does not define sacrifices in the same manner. So, I have another question. From a biblical viewpoint, is Rosh Hashanah a high holy day? Another answer, absolutely not. If it were a major festival by God's standards, one would assume Moses would have written more than a footnote about the so-called Jewish New Year. The only other primary reference to this holiday is found in Numbers chapter 29, verse 1. In this parallel text, the specific sacrifices of the festival are explained. Apart from these two verses, this very important high holiday is not mentioned in Scripture. And the holiday was not called Rosh Hashanah, the New Year, until Talmudic times, somewhere between 200 and 500 of the Common Era. Although this might be shocking to some, according to one Jewish scholar, Jews in the days of old before the Babylonian exile observed neither Rosh Hashanah nor Yom Kippur. The holiest days of the modern Jewish calendar were celebrated quite differently, if celebrated at all. Modern Jews must accept that current practices surrounding our holiest days are later tradition. If one simply compares the Bible to modern practices surrounding the Jewish High Holy Days, they might be considered mere rabbinic contrivances. These festivals are beautiful and the liturgies are inspirational, but the source materials are primarily extra-biblical. So you might wonder, what do ancient historians say? None of the apocryphal literature, nor any of the respected ancient Jewish historians, such as Philo or Josephus, specifically mention the holiday. And this is of particular significance since Josephus would have had personal first-hand knowledge of such practice. You see, Josephus was a priest while the temple was still functional in Jerusalem. And it is from his ancient historical accounts that many of the extant details about the temple have been preserved. Yet no mention of the celebrations were noted. And that lack of detail is telling because the recognized first century writers of Jewish history, practice, and experience are stunningly silent on the subject of our now famous Jewish High Holy Days. Philo considered it to be an introduction to the month of festivals. Then only one fall festival was observed the festival of the ingathering at the end of the year when the harvest is gathered. Scripture records, And the feast of harvest, the first fruits of thy labors, which thou sowest in the field, and the feast of ingathering at the end of the year, when thou gatherest in thy labors out of the field. After the exile, this holiday season was divided into three parts to which Sukkot, tabernacles, was added. And this leads to another interesting question. What holiday did God celebrate? <laughs> well, I guess I would add to that another question. What is the holiest day? Is it Yom Kippur or Rosh Hashanah? And the answer is, it was a trick question. Neither was on God's to-do list. One of these important celebrations would seem to be the most important day to modern Jewish people. However, Shabbat, Sabbath, is the more sacred celebration. Shabbat is the only holiday 
that God celebrated and actually hallowed. Even God rested on the seventh day, according to the second chapter of Genesis. The special Sabbath of the High Holy Day season may rise above other Sabbaths, although many still view Yom Kippur as the holiest day of the year. This sacred time will be addressed a bit later in our conversation. But first, a quick college course in Jewish dating or calendars 101. <laughs> Odd as this may sound, the actual Jewish New Year, Rosh Hashanah, is celebrated in the seventh month of the year. This should stimulate a few questions. The first holiday on the Jewish calendar is always Passover. Therefore, in reality, Passover is more closely linked to what would be the true Jewish New Year. Therefore, this discussion about the Jewish New Year warrants a brief look into the Jewish calendar for clarification. The Jewish calendar isn't like our secular calendar. Throughout the Western world, a solar calendar is used based upon the sun, although our years are based upon a liturgical calendar that counts years from the incarnation. Muslims reckon month and year according to the moon, so they have a lunar calendar. The Jewish calendar, contrary to popular views, is a mix of both. Jews have 12 months of 29 and a half days, each calculated by the moon. Yet the year is reckoned by the sun, and this leaves us with an extra 11 days to take up annually. So here's another question. How do we adjust for 11 extra days in the Jewish calendar? And I have the answer for you. We craft leap years into our long-term calendar to make up for the inconsistency. During every second or third year, it's actually seven in 19 years, we have a 13th month, which is known as the second Adar. Does this sound confusing? Well, trust me, friends, it gets worse. Another question. How many New Years are recognized by most observant Jews? And there was a, an answer, but that answer comes from the Talmud, in which there was a debate. Was the world created in Nisan, spring, or in Tishrei, in the fall? And the Talmud settled it. You're both right. I'm here to tell you that there are four Jewish New Years. Don't say I didn't warn you. But it also gets really exciting, so don't fret. Well, we're going to pause things right there. I hope that you're able to follow all of that. In the next episode, we'll be breaking down what the four Jewish New Years are and then how they're relevant to this, this discussion here. If you want to get a head start on that information, though, you can order a copy of this book at our website, crosstalk.org, or you can even get a free PDF copy there, no strings attached. I also encourage you to follow us on social media and uh, just search for the handle at Crosstalk TV so that you don't miss anything. Until next time, shalom and God bless.